Hey, there we go. That sounds nice and clear. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. All right, I think we're there, Mick. I think we're in it. <laughs> it's crystal clear. I can hear you. I don't know, it's just bullshit, that is. You know what I mean? Okay, let's let's not waste. Let's, I'm not rushing it. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, we wasted five bloody minutes with shit technology, sir. So. Well, where where is this home of yours, Mick, with no signal? Where are you living these days? You still in Brum? I'm in, I'm in Birmingham. I'm in a small place called... Um, it's called a haven for piss tramps. If you have a look on the internet, it makes me and my wife laugh. It's a small uh, little, I don't know, a little nothing, a little town, a little village called Yardley Wood, and I'm about six miles outside of the city centre. So the further I am away from Birmingham city centre, the better. That's how I look at it. I hate this place. I've always said that. I'll make that clear, and I'll tell you now. I hate Birmingham, but one place Birmingham does, it fuels my music, so that's good enough for me. Well, listen, I grew up in Dorridge, just down the road from Birmingham. So, well, oh my God. so I've been going to Birmingham my whole life, so I can relate. And I used to work on Kerrang Radio for, for many years with, I'm sure, our mutual friend, definitely my friend, I'm presuming he's still yours, Johnny Doom. Yeah, no, Johnny, I know Johnny Doom, yeah. And I've always had a problem with Birmingham myself in that whenever I've done anything here be it gigs or, you know, I've just been DJing in a bar or even I just want to try and meet up with people. This, we're just going to start slagging off Birmingham to start the podcast. Brilliant. But there's a real apathy I've found with this city where nothing's ever good enough for anyone, but yet they're not willing to do anything to improve the situation. Have you found that? Yeah, you, you, are, bang on, you are bang on the nail there. It's finding those people that are willing, like-minded, and there's all these little, you know, you've got these little clicks and oh you don't fit into this night oh you don't fit into that night I've grown past it and that's in my you know I can't say it's a problem but I gave up caring for Birmingham I really did I just felt I've got no friends here all the musicians stroke friends they all moved up they managed to if you want to say they managed to succeed with a career in music and they managed to buy their way out of Birmingham I've not had that so it's I've got a lot of anger and frustration in this city. Uh, absolutely, a lot of lo- uh, anger and hatred. But I've got good memories from, we say, the old days. You know, I mean, it's not like oh, the old days were better. Well, you know, for me, this city was a better place. There was a scene here, especially with the punk movement. But even prior to that, you know, I mean, we had good indie bars, alternative bars, as it was called, then alternative music, in, and you know, we, we had places where. Everyone got together, whether they were goths, punks, you know what I mean? Not really skins. They're always a bunch of bloody boneheads. <laughs> I mean, no pun intended, but, you know, they're always sort of on the fringe and wanting to cause a bit of trouble here and there, couldn't help themselves. But, you know, everyone else got on, you know what I mean? The rockers, the goths, and, you know, those indie kids that just listen to everything. They're peel kids, you know what I mean? Like myself, that just... You know what I mean? Embrace all the quality that Peel would teach us. We just it, it it just faded. Venues closed. New things came about, and you know, I just I don't know. I just kept myself to myself, and I, I think you know I can't say it's a problem, but just I just there was just nothing out there for me. You know what I mean, there was no clubs playing music I wanted to hear, and. I wasn't getting invited or felt part of anything. So I, I just drifted away and just, uh, still to this day, just get on with my own thing. But I will always say to this day, I, you know, I do hate this place. I'd <laughs> love to be out of here. It would do my mental health, my anxiety. They're the main two things. The world are good. Absolutely the world are good. Wouldn't mean anything's any better. You know what I mean? Things are always going to be up and down. It's just the way shit is. Just this city. I hate it. I absolutely hate living in this place. It's claustrophobic for me. And it just fucks with everything from my sleep to just, just, just every day. But at the same time, you flip the coin. I'm still, you know, I'm still mad Mickey Mongo. You know I mean? I'm still hyper, and I've still got a good side. You know I mean? more than a good side. I mean, my granddad these days, and you know, believe me, that keeps me on my feet. And you know, I mean, having a granddaughter that's just probably even more hyper than a little mini goose it uh, keeps keeps you going and you know lets you lets you look at those uh little better things and i can forget about what a shit city this is and <laughs> i will end it with it yeah i hope she gets out of this place at one point in her life i really do but 
to do, but she can make up her own decisions for that, let her make up her own mind. I'm not going to tell her, you know what I mean? She might hear it every now and then that, uh, what granddad thinks of the place. And uh, I do get told every now and then, Mick, don't use the bollocks word around her. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got to say, mate, I really appreciate your honesty. It's very refreshing to hear. Well, to be honest, that's me. What, 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 what's the time? You know, I'm sorry. I'm a simple fucking person, you know what I mean? And I've still got that passion inside me. I've still got I've still got that kid inside me, that teenager, that angst, that punk. I'm still on a journey. I'm still I'm still discovering, still enjoying it, still trying to push, 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 push what I don't know, but that's the good thing. There's still questions and I'm still questioning and questioning. You never get an answer. But that's the good thing that keeps you going. It keeps me on my feet, regardless of you know, some people oh he's a negative bastard Mickey I'm, not a, I'm actually quite a fun guy if you want to come up sit down with me come to the river and fish with me I tell you what people can't get their eggs on over that like, Nick Harris Fisher you're choking the guys off his head is it? believe me that is that is my getaway that is my me time that is my best drug that really is get away to the river, moving water, constantly changing with the seasons, year in, year out, keep you on your feet again, just like music. I don't like ponds. I do not like lakes. Okay, horses for courses. But I like moving river. It's like music. It moves, it evolves, it keeps. You've got to keep asking questions, and I do that with the river, but going back to it, it gets me away from this city. It's my escape. And luckily, living just outside of the city, we're pretty much in there, quite close to Greenbelt. And it's not that far for me to get to several rivers. So it's that's a nice thing of where I am in Birmingham. But again, do you know what I'm going to say? Birmingham, shit. It hasn't even got a river. I think I even think to that like, for one of my last rants on Twitter, I've had to calm down with Twitter. I've been banned three <laughs> times. And I, yeah, I've just thought, you know what? What's the point? I'm boring myself going on about the same old things. What's the point? People know your likes and dislikes, Mick. You know what I mean? So forget about that. I'm fed up of getting banned just for, you know, for saying next to bloody nothing. You know what I mean? But uh, I did mention Birmingham is that crap. It hasn't even got a river going through it. Yeah, we've got a couple of little streams. You know what I mean? We've got a stream down the road from us. You know what I mean? But it's I can't go fishing, not thinking here. Why I don't even want to walk. It's horrible, you know what I mean? So, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll leave the Birmingham thing there. Sorry to go on about it. No, but mate, it's great. It, You'll have to take you me fishing one day, though. I've never been fishing in my life. Oh, there's so many people, but I say this to them, like, look, you know what I mean? You have to come fishing with me. We can sit there all day, and I'll tell you anything, everything. You will see a Mick Harris very, very relaxed, very focused still on the fishing because it's important to be alert with it. But you'll see a different mick out there that people don't see. They see a thing on the internet or they see a video of, you know, or they hear the music. Oh, he's angry, he's frustrated, he's aggressive and, you know, and all of that. You know, I mean, absolutely not. There's a lot of good humour in me. There's a lot of very good bones in me. And let's say going to that riverbank, that's a good place. You know I mean, I think... In all my years of doing it, I think two people, two good friends of mine have come with me. And they're not fishermen. They just wanted to come and take it in. And the one guy just didn't get it. He was like, oh, it's boring, it's crap when we go in. The other guy, he, he, he understood it. He said, I get it, Nick. I get it. He said, I'm not going to do it. But he said, I absolutely get this. And I said, there you go. I said, you're halfway there. Yeah, that's your tonic, is it? That's the way you yeah, unwind the, and it relax. Is and. It is. It is, I'm sorry, there's no drug in the world that can do that. And, you know what I mean, it's, you're fishing sort of like a little kid. I walked away from it during my napalm years. After leaving napalm, I've I, I got to admit, I did get a hunger again for it. I, I missed just being out there. Not so much, you know, catching a fish. Yes, we want to fish, but it's, it's fishing. It's not just about the, it's, it's to be out there. It, it, it's, you know, water is. It's a really good therapy, it's been proven, the sound of moving water, just looking at it. But it's the wildlife out there as well. I've always appreciated that. And it's just seeing the changing seasons, getting to fish through the year, fishing different parts of the river, seeing it change, everything, bank erosion. Obviously, we're seeing more and more of that these days. And 
Um, you know, that, that's what keeps you on your feet. And that, you know, going back to music we've, we've me still trying to push, still just treading a little bit, going a little bit further out of my depth. You know what I mean? And that's good. And that's what you've got to learn with river fishing because, you know, one year you might go, yeah, I know where the fish are. Let me tell you, next year they won't be there. They move and they move and they move. They have to, they have to, and especially today, how, you know, they're, they're, their homes, you, know, you want to call it, they, they are getting eroded and they're having to remove. They're having to like, you know, deal with you know what, what's happening, floods, and on top of that, we've got a, I'm going to use the word, bastard otters as much as they're such a nice animal. And they were here before us and, uh, you know, they got a right to be there. I'm not a fan of otters. Let's say there was a, a, a program of reintroducing them and, Let's say that program wasn't very, very well managed. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of consequences now due to uh, that. But uh, They're reaping okay, havoc. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And, okay, that's that's what happens. Uh, I mean, survival of the fittest. It's just we ain't got time to talk about the particular fish that I like to fish for, the barbel, and, you know, how long it takes until it reaches sexual maturity, till it can obviously go about its business and it's not even getting to that point now. And our female barbel population is in serious, serious decline. They are the bigger of the two species, as with a lot of female fish. And it is the larger fish that the otter are grabbing. There's a delicacy that they want. They don't eat the whole fish, which makes you even more angry as an angler. Uh, that they just literally grab the biggest fish, which is going to give the least. It's going to give a big fight, but it's going to give a dogged fight. It's slow. It's a lot easier for that otter to just grab around the neck, and all it does is rip out its uh, around its neck and inside of its, I guess, the top part of its mouth. There's there's a, there's a certain I think it's gall bladder. There's something in there that it loves. It just rips that out, eats it throws the rest of it away goodbye that's another female that won't be and so yeah it's uh it's, it's, it's knock-ons like uh many things <laughs> well listen i don't want to assume too much mick but i get it now i was looking back through the history of your work your creative output the the variety the the high level of, of productivity and within talking to you for 15 minutes i completely understand now um you're a million miles an hour guy aren't you i love it yeah, it drives my wife crazy. Uh, I made Jason, <laughs> yeah, still to this day, she loves it, but it drives her crazy. I made Jason Williamson, sweet of mum, good yep. friend of ours. Um, he was on the I last record, laugh. wasn't he? The last Scorn record yeah, you put out. That, yeah, I didn't get him on the new record. I'm a little bit, uh, little bit pissed off, Jason, but I understand you've got family and with events and everything, just uh, I was really looking forward to it. I'd written a, I'd written a track that was, just the Jason's voice sort of thing and sent it to him. Yes, Mick, I'll do it. And then it all went a bit quiet and me not being a very pushy person and someone that has not got a lot of confidence. And as much as I've just told you there and you said you get it, I have a huge, huge lack of confidence. Mick Harris is down for, but we're not here to talk about that. That's something that I'm working on and whatever. But I wish I'd said to Jason in this quiet period, please, mate, can we just get this done? But I didn't. I don't like pushing people. I, I hate that. Um, I, just, I just don't like it. I really feel uncomfortable. So I didn't. Uh, luckily, Mr. Uh, you can't moan. Huh. Uh, <laughs> well, you ex exit yeah. Jason, enter one of the most, you know, progressive well, yeah. and incredible MCs of all time, Cool Keith. Absolutely. That's not Absolutely. a bad exchange, yeah. is it? <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I am a big, I am a big fan. So, you know, when, when, Kurt, but this is something that Kurt wanted me to do 10 years ago. Kurt has been in touch with Cool Keith for about 15 years now. They're very close friends. Right. And they're involved in the studio in New York where, you know, Keith works as what go, you know, goes and, you know, feels comfortable laying down vocals with the people he works with there. And, you know, Kurt wanted me to do a score record with Cool Keith at some point, and it just never happened. And it's actually back on the cards, uh, which is a good thing with this all happening. But don't talk about that at the moment. Uh, not until I've. 
spoken with, <laughs> with uh, Keith a little bit more. He's not, not, not saying he's not easy to work. Absolutely, absolutely just delightful. What a pleasure to work with. Absolutely professional, top to bottom, and the, and the people that he works with. Just he's a busy man. He's got his own thing. He's, he's in cool keys time. He is. He's yeah. not on Mick Mongo's time. So we're going to talk about this later. We're we're hoping he's really happy with what you know with how the you know the EP goes, which he is. Um, we, we know how the production turned out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, yeah, we, we just, you know, Kurt's going to get it out and get him copies and just, yeah, just hopefully, just for him to want to, you know, do something else with me after getting an email from him, uh, which was great. I just said, yo, hopefully you can keep in touch. He wrote back. I just got I think, three lines off him. He said, um, let's keep in touch. He said, I want to work with you again. So you can imagine, great. for me to get an email like that. You don't know how much that that that, that gives a lot to my uh, to, to to my confidence, uh, you know, my anxiety levels. It's sort of oh wow, you know what I mean? It's I know it might seem a simple thing to some people, but you know, to me, it, it is a simple thing. It was a big thing, and it, and it was a, it was a real nice thing to hear. And um, so yeah, Kurt's going to get on with that. We're going to do that. Um, so, uh, How did you first yeah, meet Johnny? Did you play in the original Doom lineup? Am I right in thinking that? Uh, well, with Johnny Doom, we we met, we 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 befriended because Doom played uh, the Mermaid, as many you know, many of us hardcore bands did around, and probably supporting Napalm. We become friends, me and Johnny and Brian, um, and I think they hadn't got a permanent drummer, and they asked me. And I said, well, you know, I'm doing Napalm and I don't really want to do anything the same. And sort of then they said, well, we want to do more like a Boston hardcore thing. Mick. We know you like your siege, your deep wound. And I said, yeah, I'd actually be up for that. I said, you know, Napalm is grind, you know what I mean? And, you know, you know it's, it's got a metallic edge, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, yeah, I'm up for that. Let's do it. It's not going to be as fast as Napalm. I thought, yeah, that sounds good. I'm actually into that fast hardcore drumming. Uh, I had about four rehearsals. We started to get a set together. Then all of a sudden, they decided they wanted to be um, a Discharge-style band, a D, you know, I uh, have to use the word, the D-beat, as it's called today, but the Discharge beat, as I'd rather call it than the D-beat. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they wanted to be a Discharge band. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of doing Napalm, which has got a little bit of like that Discharge sort of themes here and there, and that you know, Discharge-style beat. Uh, Extreme Noise Terror, I've just been asked to join um, to, to help them out, uh, to step in. Um, that's a total DB, this kind of style, hardcore, you know, Finnish, um, you know, Swedish hardcore, you know, Japanese hardcore affair. I thought, oh, I thought we were doing like, you know, this, this hardcore thing and, uh, you know, this siege deep wound. And they were like, no, I want to do a discharge thing. So I came up with, uh, not many people know this, I said, well, I want to do vocals and I think John was like well yeah I can just play bass Brian was always the guitarist because John at the time was doing vocals and bass and I said well I want to do vocals I want to have a go at doing some vocals and I knew this drummer we got the drummer in we had one rehearsal so vocals me on vocal guy on the drums discharge Brian guitar discharge Johnny Doom discharge and uh, I think I got kicked out. I don't know. That's all I remember. I remember, I'll be honest. We had this one rehearsal. I screamed and growled my lungs out. And uh, I don't know if it went down too well or something. And I just <laughs> never got caught. Yeah, yeah. But there you go. There's, there's the, I'm just being honest. There's the story of Doom before they become the discharge style Doom and had a record out on Peaceful that everyone knows. Because about six months later, they got Stick, uh, who is still the drummer now. Um, and um, they recorded the first um, Doom LP. I forget the title of it, which came out on Peaceful Records. It's wild. I was chatting to Jonas Ackland for this podcast the other day, and he made a music video with Lady Gaga for the song uh, she did called Telephone. And in that video, she's wearing a leather jacket with a Doom patch. And it's just, <laughs> it's just so insane how far that thing has gone, you know. And obviously, like, Napalm Death, Grindcore the blast beat, all this stuff, which I'm sure we'll get into if you don't mind for a bit. It's insane how this local little underground, hard hitting, heavy, 
you know, progressive at the time, extremely fucking anti-commercial scene has become this worldwide phenomenon. It's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah, it is crazy. It's mad. I'm sorry, you, you know, I can still you know, remember it now. You know, Dig saying, well, I'm going to press up, um, I think, 1,500 copies of Scum. Do you want to go down to Bristol to uh, Revolver Cartel, the distributor at the time that he had a uh, manufacturing um, and distribution deal with? And um, a D and M deal, I guess it's good distribution, master uh, no master, but P and D deal, so production and distribution. There we go. And um, yeah, I couldn't wait, Charlie. You imagine going down to pick up your first album, and I had number one off the press. It had the sticker on it, and you know, no one knew what would happen. Peel gets it, he plays it about eight times, making a mess of it, and. My God, that was a short song. And, and within the first, you can imagine as a kid, you know, Peel, I've always said, uh, you know, out there and always have been my music teacher. And, you know, you can imagine round a friend, I wonder if you'll play, play the napalm tonight, you're right, sent it to him. And this was, his, don't forget, he used to do the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. as the original show. And it was the Wednesday. And uh, he said, right, tonight, he said, um, I've got some new records. He said, I'll be playing um, Napalm Death in the show. He's like, what? what? Did he say that? And, 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 and then he, he went about playing it, and I think he played You Suffer and the Kill. Played You Suffer about four. He said, I'm going to have to get these guys in for a session. Can, can, can you imagine that as a, as, a, as a teenager? And, you know, just... You'd grown up with Peel. You, it made you go out on a weekend after sitting there on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, as many of us did. Me, Nick Bull, and sitting there with your record on pause on your cassette player. I'm going to bed now. You know what I mean? My mum and dad didn't have any problems with me. I was up in the fucking bedroom listening to my punk and indie music, bouncing off the walls. That was about it. Mike, calm down. Mike, turn it down. Never had a problem. The classic my mum would say to my dad was. Leave him alone. We know where our mic is. He's not in trouble with the police. He's not starting fires. He ain't doing no vandalism. He's upstairs playing his music. Oh, it's on loud. Tell him to turn it down. And my mum would just tell him, you know, oh, leave him alone. He's all right. <laughs> he was the gatekeeper, the tastemaker, the, the overseer, really, of that whole movement, oh, yeah. wasn't he? He was responsible for breaking so many bands. And, and yeah. now, now it's hard to imagine because there's so many yeah. different ways in which we consume and are introduced to music. But then he I'd was the godfather, wasn't he? Yeah, I wouldn't be making this music, Matt. He, he introduced me to dog music. Do you know what I mean? It was, he, he played the B-side of the seven inches that he'd been sent from you know, one of his connections in Jamaica, etc. And he'd play the B-side, the instrumental, and this was the dub. First time hearing that, it was like, fucking hell. It's, it's just like this beat coming in and out. It's got all these effects on it and vocals just a bit in and out, the horn, the keys. and Oh, man, listen to that. That's, that's punk, that is. And, that, that was my introduction. That was it. You wrote it down. You went to Rocker's Record Shop because that was our best record shop in Birmingham next to Inferno Records. And you'd give them a little list of things that you'd heard, you know what I mean? And they'd say, well, we'll try and get that. Or, yeah, we, 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 we work with that distributor. Like, we'll ask them. We'll, we'll see if we can get you a copy. And you'd go there with your £1.50 pocket money that eventually become £3. I could buy an album with that. Three seven inches, or when it was one fifty a seven inch, I'd have money for a sandwich and my bus fare. It was, oh man. <laughs> How did Digby Pearson first hear of you guys? Was it from Peel playing it, or did he get on you before no, that or no, after? No, it? no, it's not going to be from Peel playing it because obviously Peel played the first Napalm record which he released. Oh, okay, he, so he, he wasn't playing the demo, he was playing the full release, no, the proper yeah, he album. Playing, he was playing Scum, he was playing Scum, but basically. As you know, there's two different sides. So uh, an A side, B side. Uh, well, obviously, Nick. Uh, <laughs> there's two different lineups. Let me get it right. So uh, Justin, me, and Nick on the A side. What's uh, your memory we, of recording the A side? Um, in and out. We did an eight-hour overnight session, 12 p.m. Was it in Rich Beach you did it? Morning. It was a special at Rich Beach. We worked with Nick Ivory that knew about punk music. He'd worked with Sacrilege. Damien from Sacrilege liked us as people. He liked, 
We got on really well with them. They'd let us support them, use their equipment, no issues. Damien had a really nice guitar tone. He offered us his guitar pedal, which is the MXR Distortion, because people still ask, what is that? It was the basic MXR Distortion. I think the free the free control, so volume, gain, and tone, it could just be the volume and gain version. So I can't be 100% on the version if it had the tone or not. But it was the MXR, that's what he used. Justin, I think we were st- it was still concert pitch, so it was still, I think, C-shot. And like, don't ask me about that, because Harris knows nothing about any of that shit. So, I mean, I'm a bit like Marky e. Smith. I know the difference between an E and an A. I asked about it. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no, no. Um, it wasn't until Bill joined. Bill started doing what's called today drop tuning. It was called down tuning, then giving it that heavier, dirtier, grinding tone, as we called it. So, yeah, two different lineups. Uh, by October of uh, 86, Justin. Uh, not given up, he just was, he wanted to get out, be in a band that was doing gigs, getting recognised. He got the offer to join Head of David. Napalm had recorded this demo in August. It was an eight track, our first eight track at Rich Beach. It was killer production. And we sent it out, we sent it to Pusshead. Pusshead had heard of Napalm Death, had been had in scene reports, and he'd heard about this super fast band that were apparently faster than Heresy and Concrete Socks, and had got the, the brutality of Siege. And, and he, 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 I ended up getting an address for him, sent it to him, um, thinking he might be interested to push more records. There was also Atavistic. Uh, they 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 had recorded a demo. We were good friends with them. There was there was this there was this thing of doing a, a, a joint a, a split album. That never happened. That's a distinct split. Um, so in the end, Justin leaves the band. October eighty six. I'm left with Nick, um, and it's just the pair of us. We we went through a couple of guitarists. Frank from Bet who became Benediction's bass player and also ben, um, bass player. For Sacrilege and a few other Cerebral Fix and a few other bands, uh, Memoriam being his latest. Um, so, yeah, that, that lineup, as I say, we, we went in studio eight hours, great, fantastic demo, sent it around a few places. Manicure's Records as well, which was just before Era right? 8, which was from Bristol. They'd done the Concrete Socks album. They'd, um, they ended up doing the split with Earache, which was the Earache first release, which was the Revenge of Martha Splatterhead Accused. Um, they did a joint release, Earache Manic Ears Records, with that. Uh, no, Core Records, let me get it right, which released the um, Chaos UK Sacrilege album. Uh, they did the joint, the Martha Splatterhead and uh, with, with Earache, which was the first. The second release, as you know, was the split record uh, with Heresy, Concrete Socks. The third was Napalm, Death Scum, which, boom, Earache just went mental overnight, sort of thing. And again, John Peel. And, and two people, and I'll always say thanks to John Peel and Digby Pearson for believing in me. John Peel for pushing, in, for pushing my music, introducing me to killer music prior to that. And then further Digby Pearson believing and getting in touch with me. So we're getting there. We're getting there. So Digby Pearson had started to come to the Mermaid. As you know, that was the place we all met. That's where all the gigs were at, especially the hardcore matinees, the Saturday all dayers. And he'd come along with like, you know, some of the Nottingham bands, the Concrete Socks Heresy. He'd heard about this fast napalm and he knew of napalm from back in 82 he'd worked with the original napalm we're no more anarcho punk style band and working with crass records bullshit detector uh you know and nick you know nick bull and, and rat the original drummer doing their their fanzine their punk fans. so that goes right back did nick and uh, dig and nick knew each other you know for a good good four or five years you know from the early 80s um so you know they, they had met each other dig i think wrote a letter to me, still living at my parents in Kings Norton, not far from here, and he just said, uh, I believe you've got a master tape of Napalm. I'd really like to um, I'd really like to release that if you want to come to Nottingham and uh, have a talk. And I did. I got a coach. He said, I'll pay you I'll get you a ticket, he said, and paid for a ticket. I went to Nottingham on the coach. 
I think it was about, we just turned, oh, I reckon it was either December 86, yeah, or it was January 87. Um, and I went to Nottingham. It was a beta max case. It was the original uh, master, and it's what they'd started to record onto at that time. Rich Bitch first beta max digital audio, which was you know, your binary numbers, your zeros, ones, ones, zeros. Again, don't ask me about that. I don't care about it. I don't understand it. Doesn't mean anything to me. But yeah, beta max <laughs> cassette. That's what it was recorded on. Dig all he was adamant of. Bring the master with you. Bring the master with you. But the first thing he said when I when he opened the door, he said, "Have you got the master? Yeah, I've got the master." <laughs> so that was it. We just spoke, and I just told him, "Look, you know, I'm, I'm, Nick is still with me on this playing bass and vocal. Uh, we might be getting a bass player in. Nick might just become vocalist, which he did temporarily. And we've got a guitarist. We're hopefully going to work on bringing in, and that was Bill Steer, uh, our carcass. Um, and oh my God, you know what I mean? It just goes and goes and goes. And as you know, I, we ended up. Nick ended up leaving." February of 87, got got Lee Dorian in because we'd become friends for about a year uh, from meeting him at um, Birmingham Gigs again, uh, The Mermaid, and also uh, Lee was a promoter himself at the Hand and Heart in um, Coventry, putting yeah. gigs on and you know, big, big fan of Napalm, etc., etc. And so I remember asking Lee to join. It was just like, he was a friend, he was a fan, I didn't you know. Do you want to sing in Napalm? It was literally, it was literally, it could have been anyone. You know, and I never had a massive circle of friends. They're all sort of, I guess, some of that probably comes down to the, the drinking. I was never a drinker. So I didn't sort of get into that side. And, uh, yeah, whatever. You ain't got to be a drinker to socialise. And but you, you weren't going down the that. pub every night. Yeah, I didn't. I ne- never, ever did. Never, ever, ever did. I only started going to... The Mermaid, after I'd all, for about six months after leaving school, I'd gone to, as I said, the the barrel organ in Birmingham and then the nightclub after the zigzag club, the power back of the powerhouse, because it played, you know, you could go there and, you know, you, you could hear some indie music, so alternative and, you know, and a bit of killing joke, membranes or whatnot, you know, I mean, theatre of eight, you know, and you know, whatever, and, you know, it's cravat. And all that, you know what I mean? And then you'd have to listen to a bloody bunch of goth stuff. And, oh, come on, when they, when they're going to put some good indie stuff, ah, oh, uh, some killing joke on again, great. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, 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 you know what I mean? Ah, oh, fucking. I don't know, that's just how it happened. It was, just, it was just a blast. We record that record, as I say, me, Bill Lee, and, um, and, and Jimmy Whiteley. And, you know, it's. All the songs I had to quickly put together after um, Justin went um, to join Heather David and to play drums. So he put the axe down to go on to drums. And so I remember, I couldn't play guitar. still can't play guitar. I don't even own a guitar. But I got this guitar. And I thought, I'm going to give it a go. I gave up straight away. I got this cheap distortion pedal. I managed to like wire it up to the hi-fi system with an old DIN socket. So real dodgy but it worked you know what I mean and get ready for this I think I was messing about with the guitar and trying to tune it oh, ah, this is hopeless how am I going to do this you know what I mean I haven't even got a guitar it's got to start writing songs <laughs> you know what I mean and I just messed about and, and it just came about by accident it was just the top E and the A string I do know those two and the bottom E and an A I think it's the bottom E and an A oh, I, mean, I know the top here, you know. I just messed about and I was just with my finger dampening. I was like, fucking hell, that sounds like a bar chord. So I just messed about a bit more. Whoa! Get all those other four strings off. And I tell you what, it was one of those bing moments. Like, yeah, yeah. Shit, you knock. It was like, oh man, listen to that. I'm sure I turned it off. And before you can imagine, Mike, turn it down. And there I was like, I was like, oh man, this is the way I'm mate. I've still got all my tablature today. If you want, what are your tablature? I've got envelopes, bits of paper, different coloured envelopes in my very bad writing. My wife still tells me, Ellen still tells me today, your writing's fucking awful. It is bad. Upside down, everything. Whatever, you know what I mean? That's the way it is. And, uh, 
I've still got them in an envelope and a few cassettes as well. I've got a cassette of uh, what would have been you know, pretty much I'd written after Harmony Corruption. I'd already written the next album, which obviously it never happened because I was I, uh, I walked away. But uh, yeah, it's just I've still got that. That ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Who's got the Master of Scum? I take it you don't have that, or do no, you? No, I don't. No, Earache has every master. That's why you wanted that master so bad. <laughs> I believe it. it was, I couldn't believe it. He, he never shut up about it. Just start of his letter, the middle of the letter, end of the letter. And I guarantee there was probably a P.S. Don't forget the master. And just, just, I've got to get it in. I can't help myself. P.P.S. The master, Nick, don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I got there, I mean, and you know, I don't know how old were you, Nick? 18? Yeah, I was coming on 19, and you know, I, I think it was my second time going to Nottingham. Yeah, it was, second time going to Nottingham ever. And, uh, no, third time. And um remember getting off the coach, and oh, man, not being the most confident, and you know, looking around as you do. It was a grim looking coach station, it was, and I was like, Okay, it's up here, and I'd already, I think the old man, classic dad, he'd already got his A to Z out, and you know, he'd got a worldwide fucking A to Z, knowing my bastard dad, you know what I mean? <laughs> Mr. Organised like that, and it was a straight road, it was, it was just parallel to the Mansfield Road, so I thought, oh, big deal, it's straight up there, and after about a 10 minute walk, and there I was, you know what I mean, beat some at tape in hand, you know, in a, in a bag, plastic bag, and, uh, rung the bell and he was at the top of this this stair this this old flat that he had the original earache office and uh oh god many a good moment there melting records in the office but that's another story <laughs> again isn't it just amazing like such humble beginnings go on and obviously you know earache now you know still a very successful label and you, you say yeah, that they took know. a chance on you but i guess that record would have probably helped them build and establish it's themselves it's right like Think it started it off. It built something. It was a building block. But Dig was a music lover. It was not a businessman. No, 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 no. Music lover, and that's why. Okay, naive. Uh, still naive. You know what I mean, it's like you know, I won't sign anything. But the only thing Harris won't fucking do these days sign my life away. And the reasons things are so shit. But anyway, um, total trust. Total trust. And you know, to this day. <laughs> I've done many records, many labels, and I can't say anything. You know what I mean, some fucking labels have even made me sign disclaimers that I won't even speak about them. Yeah, which is bad when they're the fuckers that have you know fucked me so bad. But no, 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 we dig. No, I'm sorry. I still get what is rightfully right, and yeah, I got fucked along the way as well. And you know, we 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 solved that eventually. Had to go down legal channels, but no. No, Dig, I have a lot of admiration for. He put his money in his pocket, he did, and he'd worked hard, you know what I mean? That guy was a punk, but he did the right thing. He wanted to bring hardcore, and he was writing for Maximum Rock and Roll and other European scene reports, and he was trading with other people from around the world, a lot of European hardcore outlets, trading other English stuff, European stuff, vice versa. And he set up, as you know, he started with, with the flexi, but prior to that, he was doing distribution, selling hardcore records and tapes and fanzines, saving every bit of it. So he had that understanding, and you know, it, it you know, it, yeah, and, yeah, okay, business has to come into it, of course it does. But you know, guys, a music lover, and that that's all that's all that matters. And it's all that still matters. I mean, amen and, to that. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's all that does matter. You know, I mean, it's shit business and everything shit people in all walks of life you know what I mean and just, you've got to keep you know, your soul pure haven't you as much as yeah, you can yeah you, you've got to and you know he still talk you know look at the earache the ask the earache thing I like that because people can ask him and he will answer honestly and you know Nick Harris the most difficult I was number 10 or no number 1 the most difficult to work with and what he wrote at the end you know what I mean and I won't disagree with it absolutely I'm God almighty oh fucking I'm Nick Harris he's coming to the office I'm locking myself in well, I don't care you you lock yourself in mate I'm only coming down to see you about the royalties you rightfully owe me, yeah? You don't pay me. You lock yourself in the office. doesn't bother me, mate. I will wreck everything in that office. And it doesn't bother me. I know you'll laugh and say, go on, Nick, keep wrecking it. 
coming out of your royalties. And you know what I used to say? You don't pay me royalties anyway. That's why I come here so frustrated. <laughs> it, it forgets all that, you know what I mean? And I was all in the thing, just we were just a part and parcel, you know what I mean? Of just Harris being frustrated and no, 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 I want it, no, 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 sort it, no, no, no. Business isn't like that, you know what I mean? I know that, but it was frustrating. We were all naive then and just, you know, and, you know, just do it now, do it. Yeah, 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 sign here, yeah, sign there. But no, uh, going back to that, I've been screwed left, right, and centre, boss, an absolute. Fuck your eyes open. You know what I mean, it is what it is, and that's it. it. Can't change it, mate. Go forward with it. But Dig is still there. We, you know, we don't talk, but he's still sending the news. How about that? He's still interested to hear scorn, and he'll still. And he is, I don't want it. I don't want it, a, a couple of digital files. I'm buying a copy, and <clears throat> and you know, just a simple thing like loving the loving the new scorn. Bass is sick. Loving the new scorn. Bass as ever. That's nice to get that because you haven't got to do that. We, yeah. We've got no dealings other than you know he pays. I get I get my publishing from here. Like I don't get any royalties because I stupidly took a buyout the day that I walked from Napalm. But again, that's whatever. That's all in the you know, no be done. I don't hold that about against anyone. Uh, I get my publishing and everything's down the line. I get on with the accountant guy there. Why? He's a nice guy. He's the best accountant the year I came around because I used to get so frustrated with some of the idiots working there that you just knew were, were conning you and sweet. things were just not 100% right. And but the, the guy Dig has worked with now 20 plus years. So we're talking years ago when it was all, you know, I wasn't happy and a lot of other year I can't weren't happy. But, you know, it, it, it is what it is. It was what it was. You know what I mean? It got rectified. And that, for me, means a lot. Whereas many people and past labels I have didn't want to rectify. And it never got rectified. So there's a lot of bitterness and hatred there. But not with Dig, still there. As I say, he's an accountant. He's a fisherman. So you can imagine what the pair of us talk about. <laughs> and that's great. I mean, I love that. You know what I mean? I absolutely love that. So quality, peel, Dig B. Two very important people in why I'm here now, why we're talking, and why a lot of people are out there doing what they're doing, whether that's a person that listens to it or plays it, or a bit of both. It's a shame you couldn't have copyrighted the word grindcore, eh? That would have been good. <laughs> Copyrights neither here or there. It's you know, it's you know, it's it's a nice thing, isn't it? You know what I mean, it's just one of them things. You know what I mean, it's just typical Irish. You know what I mean grindcore and you know to this day people think well that's is that the fast blast and all that you know the grind base you know, i've always said and there's not many that you know really where's the grind word comes from well it was my description for any band that used distortion on a base i've always liked dirty dirty base unless it's dob and i want that sob where you're feeling it in your bowels heaviness then that 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 makes the only time i don't want distortion or overload and fuzz all that all, all three of them and a bit more on the bass i like it dirty and that's the same with the electronic music i make i like the subs but also like the distortion dirt the filter bases as i call them mixing the both up so you know it, it's important of course it is and that was it you just sort of use that word for that description of that sound and the next thing you know it's a, it's a genre it's a term it's worldwide again it's just wild isn't it Wild. Well, yeah, you know, as I say, grind bass, next thing I'm playing, fast. It's just, you know, it was, it was just like, grind core? You know what I mean? It's like, well, grind because of the bass. You know what I mean? I wasn't even thinking guitar and, you know, vocal, just like this, you know, you know this hoover bass, you know what I mean? It's just, this, the membrane bass, my favourite bass sound. The kite man by the membrane. Go and listen to it, Matt Astor. And, and you know, John Robb knows how much I love that bass. It's one of the best grind bass sounds ever. But, you know, the swans, I describe them as grind. So, yeah. okay, there is an overdriven bass in swans, but quite clean and direct, precise, and a big dynamic all about volume and, and the passages in, 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 in swans and just that attack, that space, that attack. You this big volume and this big boom, dunk. So they could allow that big, it breathe. Their music just had depth and it could breathe. So it was grind. It was grind. And I'll tell you what, 
That's the one band. My father, he said, I hate this band. I hate this singer of all the music our Mike plays. That bloody band he plays with that vocalist, he sounds like he's dying. (laughs) (laughs) Tell you what, I love some of the comments from you. He used to hate the swans, and I think being a little bit of a little bit of a shit, you know what I mean? It's like, I'd wait till he was upstairs in the shower on the toilet, and you know I had to put you know I had to put raping a slave on, you know what I mean? Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, and you know, Mike, have you got to play that? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't, yeah, it's all about the dots, you know what I mean? That's another Birmingham thing. Nick Fuller knows about the dots. I know about the dots. So you've got to have it. got to have a bit of fun, haven't you? You can't just let it all fucking cobweb over. My dear, my dear friend, Aid Preston, is is one of my you know kind of dearest and closest friends, and he uses that word so much. And you know, I was always sort of aware of the word, but it is it's like a philosophy, isn't it? And and knowing and it is. hanging people out don't with him. Get it. Yeah, I went on this. I call it a techno tour, a Trezor Records, very very big label, nightclub from Berlin, some very very big artists, Jeff Mills, Surgeon Regis, James Ruskin, to name a few. A uh, huge label. In 2002, I was asked to do sound. Sound for a techno tour. That's a fucking hard job, isn't it? <laughs> you know I mean? left, left and right, Mick. Make sure it's loud. And we don't mind if you want to do a little bit of EQ sweet. If you want to put a bit, bit of reverb on. Yeah, I'll put reverb on. Don't you worry. I'll make sure it's loud. <laughs> so anyway, this techno tour. It was a four-day techno tour of um, Spain. And... Um, there was this one guy there, still around. He used to run a huge club called Lost in the early mid nineties. Techno, very successful techno club called Lost. Steve Bicknell um, from London, a successful DJ and a label as well, and st- still going, still out there. And um, he was on this tour, and I think all he heard, me and Regis, Carlo Connor, another ex me. He managed to get out of Birmingham as well, lucky bastard. <laughs> and um, he um, he said on the fourth day, the final day, and the, you know, these fucking late night techno dudes, you know what I mean? Fucking doesn't start till 2 a.m., finishes at 10 a.m. You know what I mean? It was about, I remember it was about 7 a.m., and it was about another hour till I was on with Carl doing the sound. And uh, he just finished his set, and I think we were sitting down and a little bit of a fucking smoke. And he finally spoke to me. You know what I mean, because I think he was just like, "How do you approach this? How is he so hyper? He never settled. He's always making fucking noises and ticks, as my wife calls it." And he's like, "Yo, does he ever calm down? This guy, like, you know what I mean, even after smoking, he said the guy just doesn't fucking calm down." Anyway, he come up to me and he said, "Nick," he said. uh, I know we haven't sm- that spoke and uh, just, you know, Steve Bicknell, I said, yeah, I know all about you and your label and all that. And I think he was like, oh, he knows everything. I said, yeah, no problem. And he said, do you know what? He said, I get this thing you and Cole keep saying, the Birmingham Doss. <laughs> I tell you what, I just cracked up the smile on my face. You know what I mean? It's probably a red eye, bloodshot and tired and soaking. And just, just to hear this guy say it that it's, not come near me for three days. And then finally on the fourth day, Mick, I'm Steve. And then I say, yeah, I know who you are. I know everything about you. And you know what? I get this Birmingham dust now. Because <laughs> me and Carl will just get, yeah, and you know, just things like that. Oh, I love and I constantly write it. And there's people out there, you know what I mean? Some of them are mad rants and I'm not so rants. And you know, they're like, yeah, Mick's the dust. And I'm like, you don't even know what the fucking dust is. You just, Mick has put it. So you think... <laughs> <laughs> Me and Ellen laugh, we look at some comments and we're like, this one is not the Doss, he's let alone the Birmingham Doss, which is the next level. Johnny Doom knows what the Doss is, because he hangs out with Nick Bullen, who totally knows what the Doss is. Jason Williamson knows what the Doss is. And to quickly go back to the beginning, I want to be quick, remember we said about Nicky Mongers. Jason Williamson, just after Christmas, said, I'm sorry to laugh, Nick, but he said, what you just said to me, Three times he texted me, and the third time he said, I'm really sorry, Mick, he said, but what you've said has killed me. What I told him, I said, well, the rule in the Harris household is I'm not allowed to get up with my wife, with Helen, and he knows us very well. And, I, and, and he said, and he said, what is the reasoning, Mick? I said, well, she needs 
30 minutes without me in the morning just to be, I need to get my head together because as soon as Mick gets off, that's it. It is non-fucking stop. And he, he just, he howled. He said, Mick, it's one of the, I said, oh, you can laugh. I said, you know, it's not a lie. I'm not, he said, no. He said, I oh, know. He said, I can only, and that he just said, mate, that's just so funny that you've got that rule. I said, well, it's a rule. I said, I'm not allowed to get downstairs <laughs> for 30 plus minutes. I am banned from my own fucking house. And then when I do get up, she'll say, please, Mick, not now. Not <laughs> now. Oh, I get a double and I get that look, you know, the eyes and you're like, okay. And I might just start. I might just be starting my coffee and she's like, she'll shout. <laughs> oh, she'll shout. And I'm like, you've been told, Mick, the boss has told you. <laughs> it's always good to know your place, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and she's a fisher woman as well. So uh, how about that? How good is that? A woman that's into good fucking music, yeah? She's got a heart of gold. She's, she's the strongest woman on this world. I tell you, mate, she deserves more than a fucking medal dealing with me. But beyond that, all of that nonsense, I mean, she, she's a fisher woman as well. She fished as a kid with her father. So how good is that? Mate, I have thoroughly enjoyed the energy and enthusiasm and passion that just comes off the phone. I kind of wish we'd done this in person because we're we're only really down the road from each other. But promise me this, Mick, when things are sort of reopen again and people are allowed to mingle in the you know the old fashioned way, we've got to get together and and do a part two of this. I'm going to have to love you and leave you in a minute because I've got another interview no, that's lined fine. up. No, you're getting. But, um, it's been a pleasure. To- you're the sort of person that I enjoy personally. You're not great with words. You, 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 you're the idea. Of, you're someone that I'd rather talk to, not just yeah, Mick. So how did you do that? How do you record? What what sound effects do you use? What do you do? How's this? How's that? You know, you, you, we don't need any of that shit. The world's boring enough and congested as it is. So just be open and talk about just real things. I think it just makes for a much better interview. But along the line. You'll, you get, because I enjoy it, you, you'll get your little neat bits, as I do when I read a good interview or watch a good interview. You know what I mean? You'll, you'll get those little, bloody hell, we found out. Oh, I didn't know that, and it led on to this. Um, so I've enjoyed it, and I will always say, to, you know, because I don't get to do it often, I appreciate your time as well, um, thoroughly, because I've had no problems with it. I appreciate you've given me your time to do this. That means a lot to me. That means a fucking lot to me. And I don't forget them things. Uh, I'm just a normal person. I've got my issues. We've all got little issues. But you know what? I can't change some of them. I've just got to learn to live with them and, you know, look forward and get on with it. Do you know what as well, mate? Thank you so much for those words. I th- I think that as much as we are down on Birmingham and as much as it does lack certain qualities, there is a real salt of the earth humility and grounded down the line straight talking honest real ca- real what, character that runs through this area yeah, well, and when you we've got yeah anything anything north of the watford gap we all know that me and helen <laughs> met some beautiful beautiful northern people we go to the same place year in year out we've had people say don't you want to go anywhere else no and you know what it, it probably it's irrelevant to you but we can piss in the dark in that place because we know where the toilet is. How about that? That yep. means a lot. But it's a place we feel so comfortable with. And it's why I'm, it's why I named the new Scorn album The Only Place. And people, you know, people don't know what's that about. The Only Place I am at 100 and more percent ease. I'm someone else that's another place. We talked about the river. You get me in Tembe an even more different person even more different person that's oh yeah that's that's a, that's another that's another that's another dimension that is but yeah that's our special special little place our little getaway that is we don't care people saying why do you go there but we met these northerners there that had come they're really nice people we got talking i think they were like it's young because they're old people that go and we like that it's older people you're going to deal with younger bloody people and whatnot and chads and all that and, and we got talking and you know, after a couple of days you know, keeping that distance obviously they you know, we, we Helen said to them you know just we love people up north 
And they absolutely loved it. And, you know, well, I ain't putting people down south. Not at all. There are plenty of things down London. My visual man's down London. You know what I mean? And whatnot. A lot of things down there. And, and I enjoy doing gigs. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, no, he, he, he agreed. You know what I mean? What friendly people. Birmingham people. He said he's never met you know, anyone bad from Birmingham. So, uh, yeah, we do have that. We do have that. You know what I mean? Just, I've just got a few hang-ups with it. But what you said... Uh, just a, you know, a couple of minutes ago, you you are right. Uh, we do have that here and in abundance. Good folk, Mick, you're one of the best, mate. I hope to see you in real, you know, real life super soon. And I'll keep in touch. I'll let you know when this goes up. And let's definitely meet up and and you know chew the fat some more in the uh, hopefully no not too distant future, man. Excellent. I'm going to go and have a coffee now. Amazing, <laughs> Mick. Thanks so much, mate. You take care. All the best, bud. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Ready for takeoff. Mongoose Mix, Sushi the Cat, Cookie, Cookie in the field. Like cabin fever, stuck in the box, the world cycle, the primer. Lyrics come out 